good morning everyone and thank you so much for joining us for the session today uh, it's, it's a privilege to be on the stage with all of you and i think you made my life easier uh, because of the chat we've had this morning too uh, very clearly uh, a big thank you to et detail for this business leadership summit inaugural session and today's first session is going to be a very interesting one uh, very clearly around the next wave of retail the kind of changes we are seeing post covid on the demand side the changes we are seeing on the supply side how sustainability is playing a role and not only that what kind of innovation have we seen from players over the last year year and a half with this let me start off with the panel and perhaps i'll request all the panel members to just give about 30 seconds to 40 seconds around your business because everyone may not know i guess everyone will know but let's give them another chance to do you guys better uh, and then talk about little bit of the challenges that you're seeing for this year so johnson why don't we go with you please if you may check i guess that's age over wisdom is it thank you very much for that uh, uh, my name is johnson vergi i look after fossil uh, for the indian continent and the countries around the indian continent uh, it's going to be an interesting year to 2023 the way i read it uh, we've gone through the depths of covid we've gone through the resurgence which which happened over 2020 and 2021 we are uh, experiencing the highs and the and the rebound back in 2022 so what does 2023 open up for us it's going to be an interesting year because suddenly you have this entire story changing from a pure online story back into a resurgent offline story and where's the balance is 2023 going to be the year of balance is it going to be you know e-commerce uh, uh, leading the show uh, but the rest of the, the the offline world straggling behind it's going to be interesting uh, hopefully we don't have anything as significant as covid hitting us in 2023 if that's the case then i think a lot of eyes across the world are going to be focused on india why india because we've got all the advantages of a youth economy we've got uh, great traction expectations from across the world is that india will continue to grow so i think in short all in all a very exciting year we're going to learn more stuff that's for sure we've been you know burning the midnight oil to learn over 2020 and 2021 we've relearned our lessons in 2022 2023 is going to be fun too thank you johnson great to hear the relearning aspect of 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 2022 but rajesh show it to you you know something around uh, your your company and what you're seeing thank you thank you harsha uh, good morning friends my name is rajesh jain i work for an international premium lifestyle brand uh, called lacost so uh, if we see after 2014 2015 when uh, online had started coming into india a lot of retailers had started feeling the heat who were only into the physical space but by the time 2017 2018 came i think we were all settled uh, there was a collaboration between online and offline online people started coming offline and offline started joining online we started our own brand.com websites also and suddenly covid struck and none of us knew initially that what would happen lot of us started thinking that this is the end of the world and uh, nothing will happen safety security are the top things in the mind uh, and no uh, customers would ever visit the physical stores but thankfully now after the covid is over and the lockdown has started lifting from the physical doors we so we see that hordes of customers so many customers are visiting the physical stores also now that the going appears to be very very good people are very happy coming out shopping meeting each other going for uh, entertainment going for food outside that it promises a very very good future however having said that we all are curious we all are curious about what will happen in future and in fact when a lot of people say that innovation uh, necessity is the mother of all inventions i personally believe that it's not only necessity it's also curiosity with the curiosity with the help of curiosity only we are going to the mars we are going to moon there is no necessity as of now to go to mars or to go to moon but there is a curiosity and that curiosity is what we see in retail also today and i'm sure that the next times the future will throw a lot of interesting opportunities and uh, we look forward to as retailers we look forward to that kind of uh, new era in retail thank you 
Thank you, Rajesh. And uh, with your aspect of curiosity, Charat, over to you. Are you also seeing this whole thing around the curious consumer, uh, a changing kind of demand situation here? Uh, yes, Harsha. So, uh, good morning, everyone. And just to give a brief, brief introduction, uh, I'm Charat Narsiman. I am uh, the MD of a company, Indian grown retail men's clothing brand called Indian Terrain. Started off in a small town called Chennai. I still call it a small town, um, but national today. And uh, uh, one of the few people I think I can say has been there for 17 years. So I started off this brand pretty much 20 years back. So uh, it's, it's been interesting to see how, how you can grow along the way India grows uh, and how there is so much more opportunity to be made. Uh, I actually, actually um, go back to a statement you made about challenges. Uh, I like to view 2023 as more opportunity and less challenges, uh, although challenges will be there. Uh, that's because I really think that 2023 will be the beginning of a, I would say, three to five year period of potentially wonderful opportunity. Um, and if executed well, there's a lot to be taken. I agree with Johnson's point of view. The eyes are on India. It's still doing well. So there's a lot going right. Uh, but two takeaways over the last two years and something from our experience uh, the real resurgence is going to happen in what is now common term, which is Bharat. Uh, I mean, the emergence is stunning uh, in all forms of retail, digital, non-digital. I think as all of us see it on the, as retailers, we see it on the ground. But we're really going to see the emergence of the next 400 towns driving commerce across categories uh, in the next three to five years' time. So the real question for us is, are we prepared for that as a business? What are we doing to think about that? And what are we thinking about that from technology point of view, access point of view, consumer understanding point of view? Because that's really where the next wave is going to come from. Thank you very much. Sanjeev, I'm sure you are ready for these challenges, sure. You've been sort of telling us all interesting stories since you've been sitting. But you know, something about your business and I won't call it challenges, but opportunities for you. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. My name is Sajeev. Uh, I, I lead a brand in India called Being Human. Uh, well, uh, more than uh, a celebrity endorsed brand and I'm told that it's the, I mean, of course, we have the data post pandemic, one of the fastest growing celebrity brands uh, offline uh, in India. However, uh, you know, as, uh, as Johnson and as Rajesh and everyone here has already stated that, you know, post pandemic, a lot of things have changed. Now, as we, as we know that, you know, by 2030, uh, you know, retail in India is going to be roughly about uh, $2 trillion is what I'm told and will be contributing roughly about 10% to GDP, 8% to employment, so on and so forth. But the question here is how is the landscape changing and how are retailers gearing up for that change in the landscape, whether that change is coming through omni-channel, you know, whether it's coming through, uh, you know, digital interventions, whether it is coming through opening up stores. What we are experiencing as a brand, and because our brand is more Gen Z and millennial, uh, we, we are seeing that, you know, there's a, there's a humongous increase in our business in tier two and tier three. Uh, and I was just giving examples uh, 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 before this when we were catching up, is that, you know, today, uh, my tier two and tier three business in terms of online ordering has suddenly seen a massive jump. Now, why is that happening? Now, that's happening, and again, you know, a, a small research shows that, uh, told us that basically uh, housewives, uh, you know, uh, homemakers who, who used to watch television earlier when, you know, the kids are gone to school, husband is out on work, everything is done, and they are sitting and watching their favorite serials, have now switched on to spending a lot of time online. Uh, whether it's Facebook and I'm even Instagram and you know, getting to understand. So, so honestly speaking, for the way we look at it is that, uh, you know, whether it is uh, uh, one of the 450 towns in India uh, doesn't really make a difference in terms of understanding fashion because Recently, we did humongous amount of, uh, you know, uh, servicing an order, which, which, was, which was from a very small town in Uttar Pradesh uh, of, uh, of, of garments, which technically, you know, we would, we would 
definitely push through our Mumbai or Delhi or uh, you know Bangalore stores. So India is growing fast and more than India I would rather use the word Bharat is growing very fast and uh, as far as being human is concerned we believe in being in the conscious space and that's where you know the word being human uh, for us uh, as in today's uh, date stands very heavy on our shoulder because it's a huge responsibility which we are now executing quarter by quarter and the conscious space that we are talking about is 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 all about you know sustainability giving back to mother earth giving back to society and 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 a whole lot of other uh, initiatives that we are looking at uh, sustainability comes at a cost everybody tells that uh, but our way of looking at sustainability is slightly different uh, we say that if sustainability comes at a cost then what are the other unnecessary costs that we can eliminate from our supply chain from our packaging and so on so forth which can actually help us deliver these sustainable products now not 100% but of course we we start small and then grow it big and that's where we are and i believe that this is going to be a very uh, you know going forward the next couple of years is going to see us uh, through many digital interventions which are going to happen uh, uh, and and like five years back when we used to discuss me and rajesh uh, commonly in most of the panels we used to discuss about omni channel that you know omni channel is coming and you know this is what is all about today omni channel is like hygiene i mean you have to have omni channel we have seen 20 25% growth when we launched our omni channel it has really helped and as mr koshi was also saying when when ondc protocols are alive that's actually when the actual game begins because then you are exposed to every single non captive uh, you know customers out there and and that's that's where the metal comes into play but yes gen z and millennials are here to stay and they are the ones who decide they are the ones who are and i see a lot of gen z and millennials here today uh, uh, they are the ones with the least amount of patience uh, when it comes to shopping uh they believe they want it here they want it now they want it from the store they want it in their house they want to return it from their house but buy it back again from the store and that's what we all retailers need to be ready with it has to be seamless it has to be completely a uh, comfortable customer journey and a uh, excellent customer experience which is going to stay that's that's what i think is going to happen in the next couple of months yeah yes thank you sanjeev thank you well very well said and uh, from uh, johnson coming at you from an iconic from a celebrity brand to an iconic brand how are you seeing the demand scenario uh, sort of changing over the last 2 3 years you know it's gone through ups and downs but how do you see it uh, uh, shaping in for the next 2 uh, years i would say johnson um, we do have celebrities for our brands but yes i think in terms of demand i guess sp spoke earlier uh if 77% approximately uh, uh uh is is the the percentage of millennials and gen z as a contribution to the total uh, mass of indians that we have that's an extremely powerful voice that is there in the market today so i think we are one of the few countries where demand's going to sustain itself over the next decade possibly uh the, everything points to the fact that as the disposable incomes increase as the youth get into the market uh, as a very resurgent india is visible i think demand is only going to keep growing if you compound uh, uh, an 8% growth which hopefully is the least that we would do as an average we're talking of completely trans transformed businesses that will happen and opportunities that really don't exist in other parts of the world i represent a global organization here and when we look at it from a world view there are very few countries that offer the level of possibilities and the level of opportunities that india can have over the next 10 years so the very short answer to demand is there'll be a lot of it thank you johnson and rajesh what's your can feeling I, may, may i add something to what johnson Please. said like see suppose uh, so if i look at the scenario immediately when covid uh, lockdown started lifting uh, and we we were talking about something of similar sort in these kind of panels in at least two three consecutive panels when i said that uh, demand is likely to be very high in the next 3 to 4 years other co panelists on this stage would not agree with me and i'll tell you where i was coming from i firmly believe that the past holds the key to the future 
during covid also a uh, lot of brands or a lot of retailers were struggling on how to maintain the optimum inventory because that's a cost if you carry a lot of inventory it doesn't get sold then you are doomed on the other hand you have to continue to uh, provide freshness to the stores that the customers come and buy it from there so what we did at that time is we took a leaf out of our past we went and started analyzing the data on what happened immediately after the 2008 recession what happened immediately after demonetization because that's when in both the circumstances the retail had got a big hit and based on that data we could actually predict the future that if similar kind of trajectory works then what kind of inventory we should have in the stores and thankfully because of that analysis we were sitting on an optimum inventory with a very great aging of the inventory similarly immediately after these two events that i have just said that during recession and post uh, post monetization we saw that the demand grows like many folds the demand from the customer side continues for the last next 2 to 3 or 4 years and the retail works wonderfully well and that's what i say it with uh, at least in my own opinion i say it with conviction that the next 3 to 4 years will be uh, will see great demand in retail the only exception could be a global recession if recession comes then it could be another uh, cycle of uh, a downtrend but the life comes in phases and this will again go up really encouraging to hear this uh, overall uh, sanjeev what's your feeling you know uh, indian brands sort of scaling up rapidly the last two years what, what, do you feel if you have a similar kind of feeling as what rajesh and yeah, johnson have absolutely i completely agree with what rajesh is saying uh, demand is only going to go up and just to without you know giving out numbers here just to let you know we have been growing at 80% year on year 80% year on year when i took over the brand we were at somewhere around you know a, a measly 12 10% 12% kind of e-commerce penetration today it's 22% and this is all in the last one one and a half years uh so so demand is here to stay and as rajesh said that if you're not hit by a a a massive recession because i believe india will still sustain a mild recession because of being you know uh, atmanirbhar uh, from that point of view but uh, also the fact that uh, uh, next 3 4 years is going to see some phenomenal growth in terms of uh, you know in terms of demand now as a brand now again coming back to what we are doing as a brand uh, we we focus on a lot of uh, ethnic diaspora across the world and and that has actually uh, given us uh, a very strong uh, growth trajectory in the last 6 months uh, for example we launched our bangladesh store now bangladesh uh, you know uh, pardon my french but a lot of uh, people think bangladesh uh, is is not the place to do retail because it is the hub of manufacturing so on so forth but just let me tell you uh, you know uh, the per capita gdp of bangladesh is higher than india uh, the middle class of bangladesh today Uh, is uh, earlier there was no middle class there, were, there was there was the rich and then there was the worker class the middle class of bangladesh and i'm saying this because i spent like a month out there launching my stores uh, uh, the middle class of bangladesh during covid technically said that you know we don't want to die in our house we want to die working at the factory and that is exactly when bangladesh was had become one of the largest supplier of ppe kits and you name it across the world now what happened when we launched our store uh, i actually we we sent across uh, you know a uh, three months of uh, inventory for a for a small store which we opened in bangladesh the whole inventory was sold in exactly 29 days three months of inventory so that is the kind of demand that we are seeing we are launching four stores uh, three stores this uh, uh, the next year in in canada again focusing on the diaspora the ethnic diaspora and that is where the demand is still uh, there in india we are seeing we are seeing a, a literally you know we are growing double digits every every two quarters i mean sometimes i get scared that is this real uh, and then we understand no this is i mean this has been happening continuously over a period of time post pandemic and and you know me rajesh and a whole lot of other ceos uh, of the fashion industry we keep exchanging notes uh, uh, between us and and it is here to stay and 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 that's exactly where that boom is happening yeah sandeep thank you charat are you seeing this demand upsurge uh, on online and offline both are you sort of seeing it 
uh, we're moving together. How are you feeling? I think the last 12 months has been very strong offline. I think it's been a massive resurgence. Uh, but online's here to stay for the long haul. Uh, I, I think I completely echo the demand side. I just want to add maybe a couple of shades to demand which can also help all of us as retailers, not just fashion retailers. The, there is a nuance in this demand that I see which is happening, which is of a trend of premiumization. Uh, consumers want to pay more, they are willing to pay more if they see something worth it. And that is across town classes. It's not restricted to the big metros alone, it's across the board. There's a massive opportunity for all retailers, irrespective of whether you are in food or fashion or whatever it is, to make note of that trend and say, can you really latch on to that? And I see that happening for the next decade. This trend of premiumization will be here to stay. Uh, even we are seeing it in soaps as a category, right, which has been there around. The other trend is, uh, India is at the end of the day a European Union, right? 30 states, each one of its own. No two states are alike. Um, very different cultures, very different buying behavior different economies driving each of this. So I would say, I would say everybody should look at all 30 states individually and say, can I really max out in a few? Have I really maxed out in a few? Because the opportunity could be huge in just maybe four states. Uh, and if you really don't double down hard on that and capture that demand, you always run the risk of being uh, you know, steamrolled over by somebody who has more capital and more money, things like that. So the opportunity is there, the demand is there. Uh, you can even, the beauty today is that you can pick your battles, you can pick the markets where you want to really win and go, go really hammer and tong behind that. And it will still give you massive scale. Very encouraging to hear this from all of you. Johnson, coming back to you on the topic of sustainability uh, and uh, the conscious consumer, are you seeing that as a stronger trend over the last year, year and a half, uh, in India especially? I don't think sustainability is a matter of option. It's, it, 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 I, if you look at a millennial and a Gen Z crowd, and if you are unaware or uh, unwilling, <coughs> sorry, unwilling to understand the importance that that population attaches to Mother Earth, attaches to their future, I think brands are not going to sustain themselves very long. Now. Sustainability is definitely going to be there. So if, the reality is that there's been uh, the, the, the younger crowd, the, the youth, uh, millennials, Gen Z, a far more understanding of the need for sustainability and sustainable practices. They're far more conscious of that. and. I'm not saying that it is the prime consideration for any purchase, but it's definitely a relevant uh, element of purchase. I think what we're going to see is not only consumers operating and asking for what is your sustainability quotient, and this is not just going to be, you know, sustainability as one of those lines and one of those elements in your, in your, in your page, in, in your website, you know, the last tab on your website. It's going to be, I think, very core to what you actually execute. The next stage is going to be beyond consumers when other people react to consumers, how is that going to carry forward? And I'll give you an example of one of our retail partners. I'm looking at it from the other side. Consumers are bringing up sustainability, but it's reached a point where one of our retail partners, where we take retail space, uh, told us, you're going to remodel your store as per contract, and by contract, all of us have to remodel our stores in X period of time. Said, you're going to remodel your store, but you're going to make sure that you reuse at least 30% of what you have in your existing store. Now, this caught us absolutely by surprise. What do you mean reuse, reuse anything from an existing store? Our understanding of remodeling a store is pick everything, throw it out and get a brand new store because you know, you'd love to go and tell the world, here's my new format of store and it's completely different from my earlier format. And if a consumer comes back and says, but what are you doing with all that stuff that you invested money in? Where's that going? How sustainable is that? As a consequence of which, we pushed ourselves and got in this whole concept of a reusable store. So we brought in 35% of whatever was in the store and reused 35%. So I think we are beyond the stage of consumers looking for sustainability. Consumers will look for it because they value their lives, they value their future, they value Mother Earth. I think the environment is going to turn around and say, if you aren't sustainable, there's a bigger price that you have to pay than what you thought you have to pay. Johnson, thank you. Uh, Rajesh, you know, on sustainability again, you know, at times the uh, consumer is pretty schizophrenic, right? You'll have uh, 
uh, your children saying that you are sustainable and suddenly you want to order it on let's say a 10 minute kind of an offer at home right uh, so at times so how do how do you deal with that dilemma right you know it's coming your way uh, you have to as leader sort of stake put a stake in the ground at the same time it will not be sort of be, be sort of totally there as of today so how, how do you deal with that as, as in your firm See, so uh, I completely agree with when Jen Johnson says that uh, sustainability is not an option, it's a necessity and uh, current uh, Gen Z and millennials are more aware and more… Uh, 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 they, they, they look for it uh, as compared to the past generation, they are more into it. If we look at sustainability, I think there are three main elements that come into sustainability from a product point of view. One is, and if I talk about the fashion products, it should be, uh, it, the product should be recyclable, it should be durable, and it should be environment friendly. Now, I don't see that sustainability or ESG is mainly for a marketing tactic, because a lot of people say that, why don't you communicate to the customer that this is an uh, environment uh, friendly product? That means, of course, that will go, but that's more of a sales pitch, that's telling the customer. I believe that sustainability is our responsibility, whether or not it results into higher cost, whether or not it results into higher or lower sales, sustainability is uh, the responsibility of each and every brand, every retailer, every manufacturer across the world. If we look at ourselves, we have a very defined timelines on the environment friendly uh, reducing carbon footprint of Lacoste across the world. By 2025, we will reduce uh, our carbon footprint by a certain percentage. We've already started working towards that. In fact, not only sustainable, not only environment-friendly products, uh, we are also looking at ESG in its completeness, which also means the co uh, corporate governance, which also me means the social responsibility. Uh, so every factory that we have, every product that we have, so the manufacturer of those products have to undergo three types of different audits before they can start supplying to Lacoste systems. One is that they have to go through social compliance audit. That means you have to ensure that you comply with all the local laws related to labor and the workforce in that particular, particular country across the world. Second is technical compliance, that technically they should be superior enough, they should have uh, such kind of products which are environment friendly also. And the third, if you're using, using a wet process, then you also need to undergo an environmental audit. So these three things put together on the product side, they help us a lot. And plus the thought of the brand that we have to uh, reduce our carbon footprint within the defined timelines, it helps a lot in bringing those environment friendly and socially responsible products to the uh, retail scenario. On the other hand, even within the retail system, when we uh, do the interiors of our uh, stores, as Johnson has rightly put it, at the same time, even the suppliers of those furnitures have to be socially compliant. So they also, especially in a country like India where social compliance is not so easy and it's difficult to find even in biggest of the factories uh, in India, Social compliance is an extremely important part for entire Lacoste system and that's how we are uh, handling the entire part of ESG. Uh, and that helps us a lot in the longer run as Johnson again uh, rightly said and I completely echo that thought that it's not a choice anymore, it's not an option and it's a responsibility and that responsibility is not just to upsell, that's not just to use it as a marketing tactic. It is because we have to be genuinely, socially, and environmentally responsible. Thank you, Rajesh. That sort of it sets the baseline for sustainability. Uh, Sanjeev, when you look at, you talked about stores opening up in Canada and other places. Uh, are, are there different requirements, or you think the Indian consumers already caught up with the Western world? Are the expectations, whether here or in Canada, is almost the same? Well, uh, when I look at the ethnic diaspora, other than the size, everything is the same. Uh, Canadian Indians are way taller, you know, heftier, uh, stuff like that. So my silhouettes are different there. But uh, other than that, uh, I mean, jokes apart, but uh, the thing is that uh, everything else is the same. But I would just like to say two things here, you know, as Johnson and as Rajesh said, that today uh, I think sustainability, and I'm just coming back to sustainability because as being human for us, uh, the conscious circle is extremely important because we consider that, you know, our brand, uh, 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 you know, our brand 
has a purpose and, and we are a brand with a purpose and therefore we are working on a very simple line that we call guiltless shopping. So when consumers walk in and you will start seeing uh, from the next quarter the various uh, you know, initiatives that we are doing, uh, the denim that I'm wearing has about 25 pet bottles in it. Uh, you know, whether uh, the, the cotton that we source uh, uh, will, your, your shirts will have a barcode which can, a QR code which you can scan and you can actually see where the cotton comes from and you know, the farm and all of that. So this is just one part of it. Everybody talks about it in panels like this, but getting it on action, on the ground is the most important part. Uh, whether it's your packaging material that you work in, I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about large words out here, but I'm saying one step at a time. Uh, just to let you know, I've told my team that, you know, uh, starting next quarter, we, we are talking to the uh, forest department on reforestation. Now, every single SKU that we would sell, a part of the proceed would go to put up trees, and this is audited. We are, we are looking at a proper audit happening there, so that, you know, and these are the kind of projects that we are looking at. So it's just not about you know me selling a a a, a, a shirt which is which I call sustainable or a, you know a paper bag which most of the retailers today are using recyclable paper and stuff like that. It's a slightly larger uh, extent that we are looking at across the world. Uh, trust me, we did a research uh, whether it was uh, you know whether it's Nepal, Bangladesh, Canada, the entire GCC, uh, US or Australia. Uh, I think the Gen Z and the Millennials are the ones who are absolutely anal about your product. How, how does, and I've see, we have seen, you know, sustainable products overnight, I mean over a year kind of take up sales numbers which are unimaginable because that is the kind of support they get. So I don't see much of a difference in terms of whatever strategies that we implement here in India. And I can, I can say that more from a point of view because, you know, our addressable market in uh, international uh, locations are basically the ethnic diaspora. So, so there's not much of a change there. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, it's not an option. I mean, you, you don't have an option as far as sustainability is concerned. Yeah. Thank you, Sanjeev. Charat, what's your feeling around sustainability, online, offline? Uh, 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 you, you have some interesting examples that you could share with people here also. Yeah, a couple of very interesting examples. Firstly, you know, we have been lucky that uh, our parentage was in manufacturing and uh, we grew up manufacturing for some of the world's most sustainable brands, Timberland, Patagonia, things that you all read, we have been manufacturing for them. So we have learned a lot from them as to how it is integral to your business. Uh, uh, and the other thing is that building it into your core business is important. Most of us treat it, treat it as a nice to do thing. Thoda um, just talk a little bit about it and that's it. Unless it becomes integral to your core business, it's really not sustainable. Um, and I have a couple of examples to share on that. So, we have a partnership with an organization called Fairtrade. Uh, we've been doing it for pretty much four years now, where we support uh, 6,000 farmers across Telangana and uh, in, in uh, Salem, near Salem in Tamil Nadu, uh, who are only growing cotton the fair trade way. A fair trade is not about organic. Fair trade is about a fair price to them, which is irrespective of fluctuations, so that they can get some money. Um, and we pay a premium, a small premium on that cotton to make it happen. Uh, today, 20% of our entire product line comes from fair trade cotton. We don't talk about it much because like Rajesh mentioned, if you just keep tom toming yourself beyond a point, then the consumer looks at it through a different lens. So consumers are discovering this more and more and the more we find that they are discovering us, especially the younger crowd, the more their the stickiness is higher. Uh, and it's a business logic to me, not just a nice to do thing because through the crazy cotton prices which we all went through in the last 12 months, this partnership actually allowed us to keep prices 20% lower than what is in the market because I was able to tell them in one year in advance what I wanted. For them actually nothing swung. They were doing the same thing that they had been doing pre-COVID, post-COVID, pre-yarn increase, no yarn increase. So there's actually a business logic to be had if you make it integral to your, central to your business rather than at the periphery of your business, in which case you'll only see the peripheral benefits. 
wonderful examples from you, uh, Charat. Rajesh, coming back to you uh, and the whole ish, uh, area around supply chain uh, and fast fashion. So, how, how has that changed, you know, uh, after COVID? See, you have touched uh, something which I think uh, not only retailers, but uh, perhaps the entire, uh, uh, entire humanity is facing today in the world and which is uh, supply chain issues and inflation both put together. These are really are the big challenges across the world. In fact, we also faced uh, significant challenges in supply chain, especially when, uh, the, when we import the products or the raw material from outside India. Within India, it is still settled to some extent. Uh, what really helped here, in fact, before that, I would just like to say that when we all talk about uh, serious growth that we are experiencing post-COVID, uh, what I have realized after talking to a lot of CEOs from, uh, uh, let's say, a value brand perspective or value retailers, we see a clear distinction of the growth between the growth of a premium brand and of a value brand. Value brands are not growing as fast as premium brands are growing in the country. Apparently and clearly there is a K-shaped recovery. The premium brands are growing like anything, however, the value brands are not growing that fast is my understanding based on my discussions with other CEOs of value brand. However, having said that, that well, those value brands are also stabilizing now. They might not be growing that fast, but not, not, they are not de-growing anymore. And that is where this relevant questions of supply chain and inflation also come in, comes into the view because the cost of raw material, the cost of overheads has shot up so sharply that's difficult despite having those very good top lines, maintaining the bottom line is becoming extremely difficult. How we handle it uh, to a great extent is that we have our own manufacturing. So 95% of our apparel we manufacture in India and that helps us significantly in managing the supply chain issues and to some extent the cost part of, uh, uh, of it. because. In, in your own manufacturing, A, there is a great possibility that you can scale it up and scale it down as per the demand situation very quickly. In case of uh, buying from outside India, you don't have that flexibility of uh, changing the orders immediately, but in case of manufacturing, you can always do that. Of course, there is a time lag, but the time lag is significantly lower than what you would do in case of an import or buying from outside. So manufacturing helps quite a lot. Uh, in terms of uh, inflation, uh, I think that has also started settling down now. Uh, we see that the yarn prices, which are shooting up like anything, and I'm talking about the yarn, the responsible yarn that we buy, that has also started not only stabilizing, but slightly uh, decreasing a little, uh, not going back to the pre-COVID levels, but at the same time, the prices have started coming down a little, so that should get addressed maybe in the next uh, one or two years itself. And that is when I think uh, the growth would be immense both, uh, immense, both in the top line and the bottom line. Thank you, Rajesh. Johnson, what's uh, your thinking around supply chain? You know, fast fashion, uh, that's something you guys are totally into. A uh, couple of points here. But before I jump on to supply chain, I just want to touch on a point that both Charit and Rajesh spoke about, which is premiumization. Uh, in our portfolio of brands that Fossil has, Fossil is the brand that, you, uh, that everybody knows, I guess, the best. But the other brands that we actually have in our portfolio uh, are uh, Armani Exchange, Emporio Armani, Michael Kors, Kagan, and a whole host of other brands that we deal with as li global license, uh, licensees for, uh, watch, in the watch category and jewelry category. And the fact of the matter is that it's not only Fossil that is relevant for India. Our, our growth in terms of Armani Exchange, Emporio Armani, Michael Kors has been phenomenal. Uh, if you look at where we stand uh, in India for all these brands compared to where those brands stand in APAC, I think India is one of the leading countries for most of these brands. We are number one in the APAC region for these. So to that extent, I agree with both Charit and Rajesh that, you know, the Indian consumer is not looking only for value brands. They're looking across the segment of brands that are available and the consumer is able to move on to the brands that we're talking about. Leaving that aside for the moment, supply chain, a complex, complex problem. I mean, it's in times of uncertainty like COVID is when we really understand that we don't know or haven't done enough about managing that whole chain. Because you take a certain process for granted and th those processes may not be designed for catastrophes and, and black swan events like, like for example, uh, COVID hitting you. So that's the time when we suddenly figured that none of our 
supply chain uh, practices that we had put into the past, which are all global in nature, uh, are going to be able to handle it because if, if, if a global supply chain means one component comes from one country and that country is locked down, pretty much your entire supply chain is knocked out of shape. Uh, we have the benefit and the luxury of having a factory in India, so we were able to mitigate that to some extent. Again, Rajesh, you spoke about, have, uh, spoke about having manufacturing in, in source, so that really helped. But I think what we all realize is that inventory on one side versus the uncertainty of the other side is a very, very complex game to play. You've got to figure out how far to go. It can be a burden that knocks you across and within a floating sea of red ink. But on the other hand, if you don't have what you need when the market opens up, you're simply uh, left the, the, the slate clean for the competition. So I, I don't think we have a perfect answer. I think the answer lies particularly for categories like ours, which is a long lead time item. We are into manufacturing. We're talking of cases that take a long lead time in productionizing. So, Given all of that, I think it's still work in progress. There is no perfect answer. It sounds strange for a company that's been in existence from 1984 that you're still working on this, but I think when, when you have high levels of stress, as we've seen in the last few years, every single aspect of our global supply chain is what we are evaluating today. How can we cut short that time? How can we shave off days and hours onto the manufacturing processes? How can we turn around some products much faster than the others? And all of these, I think, are problems that all of us are grappling with. So I don't think there's a perfect answer, but it's definitely work in progress and it's a large burden if you're not getting it right. That's for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Johnson, for the frank answer. Charat, how, <coughs> what's your feeling here? Um, some of it I echo. Um, some kind of controlled manufacturing because sometimes you may not have the luxury of your own factory, but you need to figure out how to get controlled manufacturing. So I'm going to leave three three words and a, and a larger interesting thing which I will touch upon. One is um, you must build some kind of near shoring or near sourcing as a part of your supply chain strategy. Like without that, you're dead completely. Um, the second is um, it's time for large retailers to actually invest in their supply chain. When I say invest, most of the brands just want to deal with a pure trading kind of an entity. Uh, you have to invest in your supply chain if you want it to be robust. The investment could be capital, the investment could be raw material to some extent, the investment could be time and resources or capacity, buying out whatever the case might be, but you have to invest in that supply chain. Uh, and the third, which is actually more for CEOs, I wrote a book, I wrote a uh, forward for a book about supply chain uh, and it's a very interesting one. The single largest item of cost for any organization is procurement. It's the single largest cost item on your balance sheet, on your p &L. It is the least item on which a CEO spends time. It is given down the line to some sourcing head and then under the sourcing head, etc. If you ask a CEO to divide his time, the lowest time goes into procurement and sourcing and it is the single highest cost that you incur. And every time you're faced with a problem, the first eyes that the CEO goes is to is procurement cost sourcing, right? So this whole thing is about turning the CEO's eye the other way to say, start spending at least 25% of your time in sourcing procurement and supply chain. You will find all the answers. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Nicely said. And Sanjeev, uh, you have an issue in terms of moving from India to abroad. How are you sort of looking at it? It's a reverse. <laughs> it's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me about it. But I completely, uh, you know, agree with what Sharad said. Uh, you know, uh, uh, most of the CEOs actually do not look that much the way they do the rigors of the review of, of, of procurement and sourcing. They do not put that much time into procurement and sourcing because, yeah, you've got a head of procurement and uh, it's okay, he's getting it from China or he's uh, getting it from made in Bangladesh or he's sourcing from, you know, Turkey, getting it made in Tirupur or Ludhiana or wherever. Chal raha hai, kaam chal raha hai, it's good. I'm sorry, I am interrupting because <laughs> perhaps I am the odd man out here. Uh, we have our own manufacturing and I spend at least two days in a week in my manufacturing <laughs> unit. <laughs> but I didn't mean you. Okay. So, so by and large, uh, you know, uh, I've seen that, you know, uh, as you rightly said, it's one of the largest cost item on the P&L and the least amount of time <clears throat> being given in terms of rigor. Uh, uh, and, and what we did was we faced a lot of problems when we were kind of sourcing from China 
and, uh, uh, and, and for all possible reasons we just uh, kind of invested uh, into, uh, you know, into our fabric, invested into capacity, invested uh, into uh, factories saying that, hey, look, you know, uh, this is who we are, this is the volumes that we are going to give and, and then we, today 90% to 92% of all my products are being manufactured here in India. But yes, there is a definitive, uh, you know, there's a, there's a very clear investment which is going into supply chain, whether, you know, it's in form of, uh, you know, getting into RFID and uh, putting in money into a whole lot of, uh, I mean, today it's too early to say, you know, let's get into green uh, energy and all of that, it's a little too early for that. But but yes, uh, uh, supply chain, uh, uh, and, and I completely also agree with Johnson saying that it's, uh, it's work in progress, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll just uh, end with one final, uh, one statement from each of you in terms of a thought that you'd like to leave for the audience here. Now, Charat, why don't you go first? Um, I'm going to say that we should, as leaders, start looking at uh, purpose over profits. Thank you. So, uh, I would say that uh, given the current scenario when a lot of international brands are coming, new technology is coming uh, across the world, uh, the most important aspect for uh, retailers is to keep the customers engaged. And to keep the customers engaged, uh, I believe that there are uh, a couple of points uh, which are extremely important to keep the customer engaged. One, the customer is wanting to look and feel good. When I say look good and feel good, it, uh, the customer wants to see that how the product uh, looks on him or her and how the other person perceives uh, what they're wearing or what they're carrying. That's uh, one part of the emotion. And to feel good, apart from having the compliments, etc., from uh, across, one extremely important part is experience that they get, whether they're buying online or offline, the experience would play an extremely important role for all the retailers uh, uh, in the times to come. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Sanjeev? I just have a single uh, thing to say is that uh, please discover your brand purpose. Uh, with everything remaining uh, where it is, you know, uh, mind to market, time, design, price, digital interventions, all of that is hygiene. What's your brand purpose? What do you stand for? We know, uh, you know, as being human, we know where we are going as a brand, uh, what's our purpose. But I think that's one single most thing that, uh, that the Gen Z millennials are going to ask. Uh, and that's going to be very important. For something that is central to all our business, namely the customer, it is so easy to lose track of what the customer wants. And why is it so difficult? Because if you're talking in terms of 75% plus of your population being millennials or Gen Z, the question to ask all of ourselves is, do we really know our customer? Because our customer is changing before you can blink your eyes. So if there was one thought that I would like to leave this stage with and I'd like to leave you with that is, how close are we to the customer? Do we really understand how they're changing? Because they're changing amazingly fast. How well do we know them? How closely are we associated with what they are doing with their lives? How their lives are changing, how their habits are changing, how their fashion sense is changing, how their purchase uh, uh, processes are changing. Pretty much everything in their lives is changing at a speed that we have never seen before in the past. So, if there's one thought, how well do we know our customer? Thank you, Johnson. Uh, thank you, panel members, for such an exciting and wonderful panel, lots of examples, lots that I've learned. A big thank you to you, uh, to you and to the wonderful audience here. Thank you.